All right, let's go ahead and get this session started here. I think it's uh, just about right on time. Folks are coming in here, but that's all good. There's plenty of room more on the right side here too. Come on in. All right, so this is the cross-plane uh, introduction and deep dive session. Uh, my name is Jared Watts. Right there is co-speaker Nick Cope coming on right away here. Uh, we are both uh, creators, maintainers, steering committee folks for cross-plane, so it is definitely a project that is near and dear to our hearts. All right. So this is a combined session as we do every year with both an intro and a deep dive part, right? So we're gonna get into the introduction stuff that some of you all may have seen. Uh, Maybe a refresher for some of you, but we gotta start with what Crossplane actually is. So the best way to think about Crossplane is that it is a framework for building uh, your own opinionated cloud native control plane. Uh, you, don't, you shouldn't have to write any code to do that. We'll talk a little bit later on in the session about ways that you can now actually write code, but you should be able to do it, uh, you know, create your own opinionated control plane in a declarative fashion. So the cloud providers, they've been running control planes for years, right? They manage their infrastructure with control planes, and so Crossplane gives you a way to be able to, to essentially build your own uh, in your own opinionated way to run your infrastructure. Uh, it's important to think about Crossplane as uh, you know, a project in the middle there with a top layer and a bottom layer. So on the bottom, you've got an extensibility story for providers that can teach Crossplane pretty much to manage any infrastructure in any environment um, as long as it has an API. And then on the top layer, you can uh, essentially compose resources together and then offer them as a new platform API and as, a, as an abstraction to your developers. Uh, so it's extensible on both the front end and the back end. Might not make sense yet, but we will see it as it keeps going on here. Uh, just a little bit of background history of the project. We are coming up on five years in the Crossplane project. We took it public um, in December of 2018, so next month it'll be five years. Uh, pretty excited about that. We donated it to the CNCF in 2020, then we've been continuing to mature along there. We're in the incubating stage now, and we're hoping next year to, do the, to move to a fully graduated stage, um, and we'll need your help for that, so that's, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit too. And then we are just now coming off the, the heels of our latest release. The Crossplane 1.14 release came out just last week. So it is super fresh, uh, and we'll be talking about some of the key features that were, that were in that release, which is our biggest release we've ever done. Um, you know, numbers, stats for the project. The key thing here is that it's continuing to grow, but the one that's, uh, I think, most interesting recently is that just last week, or maybe just within the last week, uh, it's a lot going on in Crossplane, is we crossed 10,000 members of the Slack workspace. So we're super active there, super busy. Uh, it's a good place to get in touch with other people in the community. All right, well, let's talk about what Crossplane does and start seeing some tangible examples of it. So Crossplane, uh, you know, at its foundational layer there, is a way to manage resources that are in the cloud, on-premises, et cetera. So in Crossplane, you can represent entities or objects in the real world as resources within the control plane. So let's take, for example, AWS. There's over 900 different types of resources there. In Crossplane, there will be you know, over 900 different resources that represent every service and everything that you can do within AWS. Same for GCP, Azure, et cetera. Um, so you know all the different things in AWS and other cloud providers like networking, clusters, caches, databases, all that sort of stuff. It is represented in Crossplane as an object that you can create and manipulate, et cetera. And Crossplane goes out into the real world and makes it happen for you. So what does a managed resource look like? Well, let's take, for example, the, an Amazon S3 bucket. So on the left side of the screen here, we see a way to declaratively configure an Amazon bucket. Uh, so you see there, that's all YAML there. You can specify the configuration for that bucket. And then in the real world, out in AWS, there will be, you know, Crossplane will make it so, so that there is a S3 bucket out there in the real world as well. Uh, just like any good Kubernetes object, all the cross-plane resources also follow a consistent resource model. So you'll see, you know, in addition, in addition to spec fields for, you know, declaring what you want in your bucket, it'll also have status fields that show, you know, shows you the latest, um, you know, the latest fields and values from the real world, and then also events that tell a story of what's happening with that object as it's going through its life cycle. So the way this actually works is probably like you would expect. You know, there's a whole bunch of custom resource definitions, CRDs, that represent all those objects and you know, services and everything out in the cloud and on-premises and all that stuff. So if we work our way from the left side of the diagram over to the right, we'll see that we start with a bucket's uh, custom resource, and then you, know, you as a user can use kubectl, getops, whatever you want to apply that to your Kubernetes cluster. The API server accepts that. 
Uh, and then there's a set of controllers in crossplane. Now, for instance, here, an S3 controller that's sitting there in a rec reconciliation loop. It's waiting for events from the Kubernetes API server. The API, API server says, hey, an S3 bucket has been requested. And then the S3 controller goes and tries to reconcile that with the real world by talking to AWS over its API. So you ask for a bucket out there on Amazon, it'll happen. Uh, let's not get too bogged down in the details on this one here, but this is basically the tech stack of Crossplane. So at the top, there's a whole, you know, hundreds of custom controllers that each deal with reconciling one type of resource. And then there's a common Crossplane runtime layer that provides, you know, useful functionality that kind of works for uh, managing cloud infrastructure and resources uh, like Crossplane is, is, um, is intended to do. And then underneath that, there is uh, all sorts of Kubernetes common functionality. So we use, make use of the controller runtime to build our controllers and reconciliation loops within Crossplane, and then all the Kubernetes API machinery, the resource model, the runtime, all that stuff is very heavily used as well. All right, so we've been talking about these granular, fine-grained services and resources, um, but just those by itself of being able to create a bucket or create a database or whatever, by that self does not really make a cloud native control plane or a platform. So let's see how Crossplane then lets you take these fine grained resources and make a true platform out of them. All right, so this is some of the, the special sauce in Crossplane. This is, this is what kind of differentiates it from other infrastructure focused projects, I think. And so what Crossplane lets you do here is that it lets you assemble together uh, a bunch of these granular fine grained resources, even from multiple clouds, it doesn't matter where they're coming from, but you can assemble them together and then expose those as a higher level abstraction, a simplified abstraction to your developers, your app teams. So to make that tangible, you can say, take together like a GKE cluster, node pool, network, subnet, you know, all that sort of stuff that it takes to deploy a full working Kubernetes production cluster in, in GCP. And then you can compose them all together into a single abstraction, a single simplified resource that you then offer as like a cluster resource to your developers. So your developers will see a cluster, but under the covers, it's all that you know, more complicated, complex machinery. So the point of that is to you know, not expose that environmental complexity to your developers. You make a simplified abstraction, you give that to them. Underneath the covers, you have that complexity, but then you can also specify all your organizational policy and configuration, essentially golden paths. You can codify your golden paths into something simple underneath, uh, sorry, into a simplified abstraction up top. And then as we talked about before, you normally don't have to write any code to do this at all. You can do it in a declarative fashion. All right, so finally, let's look at a picture of this, because we've been looking at a lot of text, and I think a picture is going to help a lot here. So this is the resource model in Crossplane, and let's work our way left to right. So we've got claims on the left. The developer is there, she's eating her popsicle, and she wants a simplified uh, you know, experience to be able to just use a simplified abstraction to get the infrastructure that she needs. So on the left side of the line here, that's what the developer is, uh, is interacting with. And on the right side of the line here, this is all the platform engineer complexity uh, that they codify and put together into a simplified abstraction. So we've got compositions. You know, that's where you're composing together all of these managed resources. You can have multiple ones of those, and one of them will be selected at runtime. And then this composite resource definition, that's, like, that's what defines the shape of the abstraction and what configuration uh, knobs and you know, uh, inputs and values that your developer is allowed to touch or allowed to specify. That's the shape of the API and the abstraction that you're giving to them. So let's make that tangible where you want to be able to have your developers self-service get a database on demand when they want one, right? So the abstraction that you're gonna give to them is a Postgres abstraction. And so your developer can come, they can say, okay, I want a small Postgres instance, that's what I want. Now underneath the covers, uh, you as a platform engineer, you've defined what that actually means by means of a, of a composition. So when the developer asks for Postgres, underneath the covers, here in this example, at runtime, they're going to get an AWS composition. Now, it could be GCP, it could be Azure, DigitalOcean, whatever. Uh, fast, slow, cheap, expensive, gold, silver, it doesn't matter. Uh, one of those compositions gets selected at runtime, and then for AWS, it's going to be the RDS database, the DB parameter groups, security groups, and all that, all that sort of stuff. 
All right, so what do these composite resources look like? This is kind of the left side of the slide here where, you know, to your developer, you've got to define a contract of, in my platform, I'm going to offer to you a simplified abstraction and, you know, something for a NoSQL or a Postgres or whatever it's going to be. Uh, but you as the platform engineer gets to define that through, um, you know, the shape of your API, all the different uh, fields and values that they're allowed to set. You do that through a composite resource definition with, uh, you know, standard a open API v3 schema that says, this is the fields they can set, these are the ones that are required, you know, all that sort of stuff. Now, then underneath that, uh, there will be a number of runtime or compositions that can be selected at runtime, and those are what specifies what resources are going to get composed together uh, so that the, you know, the developer will end up getting the real infrastructure that they need. And then Nick is going to talk a lot more about an update to this, which is pretty important in the latest release. But uh, one way that you can specify right now of the developer has these specific configuration values that they've said, for instance, a location field of where they want this resource to be. And then you need some sort of way to take the simplified uh, abstract, like configuration on the abstraction to your developers. You need some way to take that and then apply it uh, to the smaller, the lower um, fine-grained resources. So we do that through patches and transforms here, where you can say, OK, when the developer specifies location, I want you to go ahead and apply that down to the managed resource on the region field. And then when they say EU, go ahead and map that, transform that into this particular EU region. And when they say US, transform that into this particular US region. So this gives you a sense of how you can compose resources together and then influence, let the developer influence through limited configuration how the resources come out the other side. So there's a lot of different ways to extend Crossplane, right? It's a framework, so there's multiple different extensions points for it here. And so we're going to talk about a couple of them real quick. Uh, so providers, we kind of talked about that's what teaches Crossplane how to deal with uh, new environments, new infrastructure. So there's a new one for Amazon, right? There's one for Alibaba and, and et cetera, other, other types of environments. Um, things you might not expect either, like there's a GitLab, Git, GitHub one, there's one for Argo, there's all sorts of things that you control by creating a provider for it and letting Crossplane uh, use that to learn new environments. Configurations are how you compo like package up all of your compositions and redistribute them so you can then, you know, apply them to different clusters within your environments and get them out to the, uh, the environments that they need to run in. And so Nick is going to focus almost entirely, I think, on functions. Um, so just a quick hint at that is that, you know, you can do all this stuff without writing code, um, but the, what if you want to take it a little bit further and write some custom logic? And then so we have a new extension point in Crossplane that is functions that allows you to write code when you need it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, providers, as we mentioned, the ecosystem. I think this is actually out of date because there's new providers that come up from the community all the time. And so there's, this is a start, and there's a lot more also. And we're always happy to have more providers in the ecosystem. So if you're interested in making some, just let us know. We'll be happy to work with you on it. And so with this uh, ecosystem of providers, where do you find them? Uh, there is a single point where all the providers are being, um, being pushed to, they're being aggregated there. And so it's a, a place to go, discover what's out there, get documentation for it, examples, et cetera, and kind of learn how to do everything you can with Crossplane. So that's at uh, the marketplace for, the, for Crossplane at marketplace.upbound.io. And that's a, you know, kind of a rallying point for everything that's going on in the Crossplane ecosystem. All right, so that was the intro session. So we've kind of talked about everything that Crossplane can do from a very high level. And so now we're moving down into the deeper dive session here. And we're going to talk about some of the new stuff in 1.14, uh, which is, you know, as I mentioned, it was literally our biggest release we've ever done. So a lot of cool stuff to talk about there. All right, so ordered deletion. That's something that people have asked for a lot. Once you get into like production usage and you know, enterprise usage, heavy usage of Crossplane, uh, you see that you need something to deal with being able to delete things in a consistent, ordered fashion. Um, so let's talk about why that happens. So Kubernetes is eventually consistent, um, and that is super, super useful and super cool when you're creating resources, because you can throw 10, 100, whatever. You can throw all these resources at, at Crossplane. It will you know, try to reconcile all of them. There could be dependencies between them. You don't really have to think about that very much, because with the beauty of active reconciliation and eventual consistency, um, if it doesn't work the first time, It'll try again. So you will eventually get all the resources created, the ones, you know, with their dependencies, everything's there. It's all good. You know, it's not complex. You got loose coupling. Everything works well. 
That cannot be said about deletions, unfortunately. When you need to delete an object that may be depended upon by another object, um, you've got to be cognizant of that. You have to be aware of that. If you delete that one object, the other one may not be able to clean itself up. So you've got to have some means of making sure that everything gets deleted in an orderly uh, you know, sequence or fashion there. So one instance or one example of this is a Helm release or a Helm chart. Uh, and an EKS cluster. If you delete the EKS cluster, well, you can't do much with the Helm chart anymore. It's, you know, kind of, it's, you don't really know what state it's in. You could assume it got cleaned up, but you don't really know. So there's lots of examples of that where something, you know, an object being dependent upon by something else uh, means you need to be aware of that. So what does that mean? How has Crossplane attempted to solve this problem? So a new feature in 1.14 is for order deletion, and we're calling it the usage API. So you can essentially capture or model uh, relationships, like dependency relationships between resources in Crossplane. So for instance, one you know, resource A can be depended upon uh, by resource B, and you can model that and s express that fact. And then uh, we have implemented an admission webhook in Crossplane so that if you're trying to go ahead and uh, delete that resource that's depended upon by somebody else, the admission webhook will detect that, it'll kick in, it'll report that back to the API server, and it'll be rejected. It'll say, no, you cannot delete this because it's in use by somebody else right now. So it really enforces the, uh, you know, the ability to clean everything up cleanly. And this is what it looks like. So this is a bit more of a uh, fully specified approach to this, because a lot of times the, what people are going to practically be using this within a composition. So say you've got a composition for a whole bunch of networking stuff, and you've got VPCs and subnets and stuff. Uh, you can express these usage relationships in kind of a shortcut. But I wanted to show you the full example of if you're starting from scratch, you can say, hey, here is a usage, so we're declaring a, a, you know, an instance of the usage type, and under the spec here, we've got a usage of a cluster, and it's by a Helm release. So we're kind of modeling that relationship of the Helm release is depending on the cluster. And then that gives the admission webhook everything it needs to know to make sure that if you're trying to delete that cluster and the Helm release is still around, it'll stop you from doing that. And one cool side effect you get here is that you can also do complete like, deletion protection for resources also. So you can admit, uh, oh sorry, omit the by field and you can just say, hey, there's a usage of an RDS database, this is my production database. Um, it's, I'm not gonna tell you who it's in use by, that doesn't matter because this is, it's in use, do not delete it. And that admission webhook will prevent any sort of accidental deletion or anything of this resource because it is obviously very important and you're protecting it that way. All right, I think that's everything for me, and I'm gonna go, go ahead and turn it over to Nick for composition functions. Thanks, Jared. Uh, I did just realize that if we have time, we're supposed to do a demo of composition functions at the end of this, and I'm holding a microphone, so it might be, it might be challenging, but we'll see what we can do. <laughs> All right, so uh, Jared mentioned before, one of the sort of uh, really nice features of Crossplane is what we call composition, which is the ability to, for a, you as usually a platform team member, to think, how do I want to frame concepts for my users, for the developers that I'm supporting? Maybe I have my own opinion of what a bucket should look like, what fields it should expose, what configuration knobs it should have. So I'll design an API that represents a bucket, and then I'll teach Crossplane what should, what should Crossplane do when someone calls that API. Someone says, hey, I want a bucket. Like, what, what in reality should it do? Should it go create an S3 bucket or a Google Cloud storage bucket, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and the way that people have, uh, the way that we've allowed people to configure this in the past has been using an API type called composition. Composition works pretty well for simple and static cases. It's kind of just a list of, of YAML manifests effectively uh, with, as Jared showed you before, a bit of copying around to take data from the input API call and sort of patch it over to the output API call. But it is missing a lot of things, especially as you start to get to more complex uh, tasks like, you know, let's say, deploying an Amazon EKS cluster, which is actually made up of like tens of resources that, that have a lot of relationships between them, et cetera. And so what Composition doesn't have today, it doesn't have conditionals, doesn't have iteration, doesn't have the ability to speak to external systems. It's a very simple templating system. And that was somewhat intentional. We didn't really want to grow a new DSL for configuring Crossplane when we first, uh, first came up with Composition. Uh, and at the same time, we know from, you know, a lot of us have backgrounds in platform engineering. Different platform engineers have different preferences. Some, some people are going to want to use Helm templates. Some people are going to use Qlang. Some people might want to write it in Python. Like, it's very hard to, you know, we didn't think we were going to invent a better language. So we thought, 
why don't we try and meet people where they're at and let people use the tools that they already know and like to configure composition. If you saw this session last year, we were just about to ship this in alpha, so uh, welcome back if you were here last year. And uh, now, as Jared said, it hit beta last, uh, last week. So the general idea here is with composition functions, instead of specifying a template, a list of resources to go create in the configuration object, you tell Crossplane, go call these functions, please. And you supply those functions. You either write them yourself, which is hopefully pretty straightforward, or you can find them from you know, the existing marketplace of functions. And then that function is kind of a pipeline. So the input to that pipeline is the observed state of the world. So Crossplane takes on basically saying, okay, a developer out there said, I would like a bucket. And I know that this is a new bucket, so there's no existing resources that it's made up of. So what I'm gonna do is take the schema that the platform engineer defined, pass that to this pipeline of functions, and say, hey, functions, what should I do? Tell me what the desired state is based on this observed state. So it's kind of similar if you've written a Kubernetes controller before. It's doing a similar thing, but it takes away tons of the boilerplate and complexity, and Crossplane does pretty much all of the hard part for you and you really do just have to say, given this input, produce these outputs. So you install a function in a similar way to installing a provider or, uh, or configuration. Crossplane has a package manager that allows you to sort of declaratively just say, hey, make this function available. In reality, uh, functions feel like uh, building a serverless function. You literally just edit the kind of function.py or function.go, whatever language you're working in add a little bit of logic and package it up and ship it. But behind the scenes, Crossplane does turn that into a long running deployment pod effectively. Uh, and those speak gRPC. So Crossplane, whenever someone creates an XR, uh, which is what we call a composite resource, when someone makes one of those API abstractions saying, hey, give me a bucket or give me a cluster or whatever the platform team has defined, Crossplane's gonna go and call these functions over gRPC to say, hey, what should I do? So the long-term vision, keep in mind we just hit beta with this uh, last week, the long-term vision is that there will be SDKs for any language that uh, people want to use to write these functions. Uh, right now we just have Go, we surveyed the community and the top three languages in order were Go, Python, and then TypeScript. So we have the Go function uh, SDK, it works pretty well. There's a template for creating functions in Go. Uh, this weekend I started the Python one, so coming real soon. And uh, one of my coworkers tells me that they prototyped a TypeScript one, but he won't show it to me yet, so we'll see how that goes. Um, another thing that's really handy is uh, we've done a ton of uh, improvements uh, this release with the Crossplane CLI. Up until 1.14, the Crossplane CLI kind of mostly just built packages and pushed them, which was, uh, which was useful, but we thought that there was more we could do. Uh, as it applies to functions, two of the really interesting commands that the, the, the CLI now has is the ability to template a function. So you can run this crossplane beta x package in it, my function, and it'll set up your function for you and get you ready to go, just drop in some logic. Uh, but then another thing that I think people will find really, really compelling, or we've seen people finding really, really compelling is uh, people coming from other infrastructure tools, especially sort of more CLI-driven infrastructure tools, have basically said they want dry run functionality. You know, Crossplane's a long running control play and you send it your configuration and it keeps applying it. But people wanted to say, hey, I, I'd like to, if a developer makes this API call, I wanna see what Crossplane's gonna do. One of the really cool things about taking all of the logic that Crossplane actually uses to figure out what it should do, to figure out what the desired state is for a given observed state, and putting that into a bunch of functions that are kind of just containers, is that we can now have a CLI tool. You give the CLI tool some desired state, pulls down all of those containers, the exact same ones, the exact same logic and versions that your production control plane will run, and sends the observed state through it and prints you out the desired state, which kind of gives you like a dry run uh, uh, experience there. So we talk a lot about uh, functions being something you use to use general purpose programming languages to provide logic, and this is, a, this is a sort of a personal and subjective thing. You know, I would really like to use Go or Python or languages like that to provide my configuration. I find that eventually you get to uh, complex enough configuration tasks that you kind of just want to reach for a general purpose programming language that has existing tooling and test frameworks and all that kind of thing. But, you know, a lot of people would prefer to use their language of choice, their configuration language of choice, Q, Go templates, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't have to write your own function. One of the neat things about functions is that they are kind of uh, allowing people to 
add new ways to configure crossplay. And so we already have functions available that uh, use Go templates to offer a very sort of Helm-like uh, experience. I think that's on this slide. Uh, where you can basically either inline provide simple templates or you can basically provide crossplay in a directory of templates and say, use this. So if you're familiar with Helm, this will feel very, very similar. Uh, someone from the community, actually two people from the community, there are currently two different uh, Q functions that have appeared uh, slightly before Crossplane was released. So if you prefer Q, similar kind of pattern, you can provide your configuration in that. Uh, we actually have a function as well that implements traditional Crossplane built-in patch and transform style composition as a function, which is useful because you can then use that sort of uh, tool that I showed you before to uh, render out your compositions and do a bit of a dry run even if you do like or find you know, appropriate the contemporary style of composition. Oh, no. All right, now it's time, now it's time for the function. Microphone holder. I'll uh, interpretively dance instead of talking. <laughs> All right, let me quit Slack, just in case there's secret sauce in there. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do here is just make a function in Go really quick. It's going to be mostly sort of copying and pasting, but just to give you an idea of what the experience is like. So, I believe we want, yeah, run this command, and I already made a backup of this just in case because the Wi-Fi was kind of slow earlier, but it looks like that worked. So what's this done is just implemented a template or grabbed a template, which I've called function demo. And you can see this is what the template will scaffold out. There's a bunch of stuff in there, but uh, the only thing that's really important for the purposes of this exercise is fn.go, function.go. Everything else you can pretty much leave. You could delete the test file, add some logic to fn.go, and then package it up and run it. The reason that everything else is there, that there's a Docker file and a bunch of other stuff, is that we do want these to grow with you. If you do decide that you have custom build and CI demands from your function, you could I don't know, build it using something other than Docker or you know, switch out the test framework that's being used. You can do that if you want, but we don't want you to have to think about that. So if I look at fn.go at the moment, this run function is really what's important. This one does very little at the moment. It takes a run function request, which is the observed state that Crossplane sends it, and then it's effectively just going to do a hello world. It's going to say, oh, I was run with input, blah, 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 blah. So, let's, oops, I need to CD example. So this command uh, is that sort of dry run functionality that I was talking about. Uh, in this example, there's very little in the input, but you can see here this XR is the input resource that the user would have created. Um, and then Crossplane is saying, okay, given this input, I'm gonna go and uh, create this uh, bucket resource here. Jared, I'm concerned because that's the state we're supposed to get to rather than <laughs> where this demo we're supposed to start. Um, let's see here. So. Ah, I know what's going on here. I bet in this terminal over here, I am go running the version of this that I, that I built previously. All right. So by default, uh, the render command is actually going to pull down the logic that you use in production and run that. But if you are developing a function, you can run the function locally, and you can uh, tell using a annotation on the function. You can basically tell it to run in development mode, and it's going to talk to the one that you're running locally to just help you develop a function. So now, if we want render, uh, it'll tell me I'm in the wrong directory. Now, if we want render, there you go. It's just going to print out this hello world thing that says I was run with this input. So let me go over here, and I'll stop that from running. And then I just totally wrote some new function logic using curl. <laughs> this is the thing that you already saw, uh, where this function now imports a bucket type from our AWS provider and is going to create a bucket. Uh, in this case, we are just, it's just a fixed output, but you can imagine this where it says US East for the region, you could copy that from the XR input. 
just kind of give you an idea of the input uh, or how you would develop a function here. So if we now run that again, and then do our beta render, it will fail again. Let's see, what am I doing here? Aha, wrong directory. All right, that looks good. There we go, that's promising. All right, and then we are back to having our bucket generated. So, as I say, thanks, Jared. <laughs> uh, as I say, we uh, uh, have the SDK and tooling for Go. It was only released a week ago, so it's early, but we've had a ton of people from the community writing these functions already, and it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, I started uh, prototyping the Python one. It's been about seven years since I was a full-time Python developer, but I'm really liking the experience of writing these in Python. And that's, I think, something that's going to be really useful here if you have uh, a platform team that aren't expert Go developers, which is often kind of mandatory in the cloud native ecosystem, uh, they can now deploy cross-plane and still have the power of like a general purpose programming language, but using a language that, that they might be more familiar with. That's, uh, that's the end of everything, yeah, right? Oh, there's one more slide, yeah. my apologies. All right, so to wrap it up here, uh, we don't want to talk about how like, you know, Crossplane is a, a community project, right? It's part of the CNCF, and we are nothing without our community. So there's a lot of different ways to get involved. Uh, so you can see, you know, most of them, you start at crossplane.io or crossplane uh, organization on GitHub, you'll find most all of them there. Uh, but lots of ways to connect with us and get involved. And then as I mentioned, we are working towards getting uh, you know, fully graduated with the CNCF. And so in the Crossplane repo, there's an adopters.md file. If you are already using Crossplane and have a success story to share there, uh, like a bunch of other people that have already added themselves to it, we definitely welcome you to add yourself to it as well. Um, so I think that there, we can go ahead and switch over to, uh, we have three minutes for questions, uh, if anybody has some. Yes, that was a quick hand. So a couple of years ago, when I was doing um, due diligence around infrastructure as code, Crossplane, Palumi, Terraform. Um, you guys were still in a primitive stage at that point, and the provider list was was kind of small. But I even then appreciated the the controller based invocation instead of API, uh, and it was just more cloud native centric, right? Um, but many people made a decision to kind of go with a different option for infrastructure as code, not to name the product. How do we adjust tactically from that perspective because that code base has grown as well. But now someone like myself who definitely sees a lot of value in Crossplane and want to include that into the ecosystem because now I'm looking at infrastructure's code with say Terraform upstream, maybe Crossplane in the middle, and then continue the march down for, with, with Argo. So can you talk a little bit about just like how people are addressing the strengths of, of, of Crossplane and how to introduce that into the ecosystem? Yeah, really good question. So I think I'm going to go behind this so I don't get yelled at. Uh, so one of the things I think uh, you could say there is that, um, say, say you for, for instance, you are using other IAC tools. Uh, Crossplane has, with its concept of providers, uh, is super, super extensible. So for instance, for Terraform, there is a provider for Terraform. So you can take your existing HCL uh, and, and just you know, show that right to Crossplane and say, Crossplane, start dealing with this. So that's one sort of, you know, you don't, I don't think you really want to scale like, you know, a huge, huge amount of HCL that way. But that's one way you can start taking your existing investments and porting them over to Crossplane and having it you know, do useful stuff for you right away. But I think another concept that we've seen a few people be pretty successful with is that with the concept of Crossplane compositions and abstractions, you know, if you're going to expose the idea of, say, a database to your users for, for their, that infrastructure for them, you can, you can give them that, um, that, that interface to work with. And then, so for under the, underneath the covers, it could still be doing Terraform stuff. Uh, then over time, without your developer being affected, you can change that to a native Crossplane implementation. So you're keeping a consistent interface on top, but changing it under the covers. So that's another way to do it. And then the third thing is that we want to do more investments in import, uh, like tools that import existing resources into Crossplane. There's a couple things for that, we could, but we can make it smoother. So you can take existing stuff and get them into Crossplane in you know, a more automated fashion, too. So those, those three ways to go about it, I think. Is it a clock, say? 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you're at the mic here. Yeah. You're in line. Go ahead. This thing on? Yeah. Um, I used about a year ago. I started using Crossplane, um, or I at least baited it. Um, it was fantastic. However, um, this was great in a greenfield environment where I'm starting from scratch for creating resources and everything you just demoed. Um, the issue that we seem to have was, and maybe you just addressed some of this, um, we have an existing environment with thousands of AWS resources and so on, and we started running into conflicts. Uh, we found that imports would happen, yes, of existing resources, let's say import a database. However, if, the, if there was drift between what my cross-plane was and what actually existed in AWS, then cross-plane would start Changing things would start overriding settings and so on and so forth. Um, are there plans to, or have there been changes to uh, support that that sort of drift a little bit more gracefully? Um, I think yes. So, if I just to make sure I understand, uh, obviously a cross plane is supposed to correct drift. That is something that it does. But if you are importing a resource and you don't import it exactly as it currently was in the cloud, then it will correct the drift that it perceives in sort By of when you don't want to do, right? Or something, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, so I think that's kind of what Jared just touched on, uh, and this is what we think of as like the import. Uh, where you could imagine, no concrete plans at the moment, but you could imagine a cross-plane CLI import this ARN in AWS or whatever, and it sort of generates you uh, a version of that. I definitely think that's the path that we will go down. Uh, I forget, Jared, is that on our roadmap at the moment? I'm not sure uh, if yeah, it is. I think it's at a couple. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little while out, but it's definitely on the roadmap. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. I guess we'll go hang out outside if anyone wants to uh, chat with us afterwards. Thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate it.